This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. As we continue on our tour through the life of lyricist Yip Harburg with his son, Ernie Harburg. We're walking through the gallery here at the uh, Lincoln Center uh, for the Performing Arts, which uh, has the necessity of rainbows, which dedicated to the works of uh, Yip Harburg, the lyricist. And we're now looking uh, at the various exhibitions and while we're looking for Finian's Rainbow, I want to tell you that in 1944, Yip conceived and co-wrote the script and put on a show called Bloomer Girl, which was a uh, way ahead of its time because Bloomer Girl was Dolly Bloomer, who was an actual suffragette in 1860 who stood up and invented pants. And it was radical in those days. And the, the show was about Dolly Bloomer. And she ran an underground railroad bringing slaves up. And she had an underground paper. And she was an incredible woman. And this was a political show. Some great songs in there. Maureen McGovern does Right as the Rain in a great way. Lena Horne does uh, uh, Eagle and Me, which was the first song on Broadway that was in the blues lamentation about the black-white situation. It was a call to action. Uh, we gotta be free, the Eagle and Me, okay? And Dooley Wilson, who was in Casablanca, signed that. Me. So, again, Yip managed to get his philosophy into his show, which was the second truly integrated American musical after Oklahoma. And uh, while, you know, it has been played around, it still marked that historically. After that came you, you mean Rainbow. You mean uh, blacks and whites playing in the cast? Uh, no, not in there. In Finney's Rainbow, I mean that it was a political statement. Bloomer Girl was a political statement, and, uh, and it was a smash hit. In 1946, Yip conceived the idea the story, the script for Finian's Rainbow, which was meant to be an anti-racist and, uh, in, a, in a certain sense, anti-capitalist uh, uh, show also. Let's find it. All right. Let's, let's find go. Finian's Rainbow. There's Cabin in the Sky, which is the first all-black uh, Hollywood film in the 40s, which Yip and Harold did also. Happiness is just a thing came, uh, called Joe. Here's Bloomer Girl that I'm talking about. So we should be... Somehow coming onto Finian's Rainbow, um, but here's Yip. <laughs> Here, there is a video of Yip talking. If you want to meet the man, you got into political trouble in this country at a time when a lot of people got into political trouble during the McCarthy years. Were you blacklisted? Thank God, yes. <laughs> <laughs> during the McCarthy period, were they actually going through your lyrics with a fine-tooth comb looking for, for lines that might be subversive, that might show uh, Yip Harburg's true political colors? Yes. I wrote a song for Cabin in the Sky, which Ethel Waters sang, and was part of the situation in the picture. It was a poor woman who had nothing in life except this one man, Joe. And she sang, it seemed like happiness is just a thing called Joe. It seemed like happiness is just a thing called Joe. One of the producers with not a macroscope but a microscope found in this lyric that happiness is just a thing called Joe was a tribute to Joe Stalin. <laughs> We're kidding about it now, but the country, this was the, the blackest, the blackest and darkest uh, moment in the history of this beautiful country. Sometime the cabin gloomy and the table That's all I asked you to know. 
Now, here we are at Finian's Rainbow at last. Uh, and uh, this was, you've conceived this in 1946. And uh, Fred Sadie, who was his co script writer, and uh, Harold Arlen demurred from writing this because he felt that it was, uh, uh, Yip was too fervent in his political themes, and he wanted to, uh, Harold wanted to do something else. So Yip uh, got Burt Lane, and then came out with this great, great score from uh, Rainbow, uh, Old Devil Moon. That you stole from the skies, it's that old devil moon in your eyes. Yeah, you and things like Lacamora, etc. But the theme of Finian's was a total fantasy. And it was an American fable uh, in which an Irishman and his daughter come from Ireland, search around, and find Rainbow Valley in Mississippi, okay? And uh, he believes that if he plants the crock of gold, which he stole from the leprechaun, in the ground, that it will grow just like at Fort Knox, right? <laughs> the whole thing was fabulous. I hear a bird, a or a bird. It well may be he's bringing me a cheering word. Our things in Glockamara is that little brook still leaping there? Does it still run down to Donny Cove through Killy Bags, Hill Carry on Hill Dare? Our things. And then the uh, southern white senator, a very uh, stereotypic part, finds out that Finian has this land and tries to run him out of town because there's blacks and whites living together in the, you know, the sharecroppers, and uh, they claim that Finian's daughter is a, is a witch, and they're going to burn her at the stake, and all sorts of, you know, incredible things that uh, say something about the American scene. But the score was so great that uh, it, people who see it do not see it as a socialist track, they, which is the only one on Broadway. They see it as a, a very, very entertaining um, musical and unique in American musicals because in the first place, there are very, very few musicals which are uh, original. Uh, most musicals are adapted from books. And this was just uh, conceived by Fred Sadie and, um, and Yip as a uh, satiric send-off on uh, the American um, uh, society. So you've got this great song in here, When the Idle Poor Become the Idle Rich. How are you going to know who is who, who is which? Okay, <laughs> yeah, like that. When the idle poor become the idle rich, you'll never know just who is who or who is which. Won't it be rich when everyone's poor relative becomes a rocker relative and palms no longer itch? What is which? When we all have earned it and plastic teeth, how will we be turned? And uh, so Finian's Rainbow has become a classic 
Now, it's interesting that Finian's <coughs> has not had a tour, a national tour, since 1948, but they play it in every single high school in the United States three or four times a month in every state of the Union. So Finian's was at the time, 1947, when a Cold War was beginning and the House Com on american Committee was starting up and they were searching for lefties. And uh, by 1951, Yip had been blacklisted from any chance to do any of the wonderful shows in, uh, that they did in Hollywood, Dr. Doolittle, Treasure Island. He was uh, blocked from working there. And then he was blocked by, from going into radio and into um, TV. So, and this is an historical fact which uh, Yip himself says, Broadway, the, uh, the American theater in uh, New York City was the only place where an artist could stand up and say whatever he wanted, provided he got the money to put the show on. So for Finian's Rainbow, they had to have 25 auditions because they said it was a commie red thing. And finally they got the money up and they put the, the show up. But by that time, Yip was blacklisted. And um, his next show was Jamaica with, with Lena Horne, which is an all-black cast. Oh, one other thing in terms of Yip's drive for um, uh, racial ethnic equality. And that is that uh, Finian's Rainbow 1947 was the first show on Broadway where the chorus line consisted of blacks and whites who uh, danced with each other and the, the, the chorus was an integrated uh, affair. What happened to him during the McCarthy era? Well, uh, he could not uh, work in, on any major film uh, that they wanted him to work on from the major studios in Hollywood. Uh, the setup was that uh, Roy Brewer, who was the head of the Yahtzee Union, I, I'm sorry to say that, uh, was the one who... What do you mean? Uh, well, I mean, this is a stagehands union. I, I'd like to say good things about unions, but they get bureaucratized and they go right wing, you know. They get bad. This was a bad leader. And uh, he he uh, uh, terrorized all of the Jewish moguls <laughs> who were being accused of communism by the House on american Activities Committee, and they yielded to whatever he said to them out of fear that they, they would get uh, branded as communists or that they boycott the film, all right? And so when, uh, you know, they, they weren't called yet been to do uh, um, Huckleberry Finn with Burt Lane, uh, th then Roy and the guys said, no, he's on our black list, okay? And you can't hire him. And then you went away and they wanted him to work on uh, Dr. Doodle. No, you can't hire him. And the same thing for radio and TV. And that was known as a, quote, blacklist, which wasn't, that was the first use of the term, because in small towns where you had company corporations going, if you did something <laughs> that the company didn't like, you were blacklisted from town. You couldn't get a job in town. But this was the first time, due to the technology, that a blacklist was national and accompanied by a loaded word, communist, that could get you fired any place. For Yip, it was horrible because the, uh, his friends who were artists suddenly had no income. And uh, there was suicides, there was divorces, there were people who left the country, there were people whose lives were just ruined. And so Yip supported some of them. Uh, Dalton Drummond, who was one of the Hollywood 10 who were first picked out by the House on American Activities Committee, to uh, go to jail for a year citation. Are you now or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party, you know? Um, Yip uh, fronted him with money and so forth. It was a horrible time. How long wasn't, how long couldn't Yip work for? For about, uh, from 1951 to 1962, he came back to Hollywood in 1962 and he and Harold Arlen did Gay Paris which is with Judy Garland, she asked them to come back. And uh, it's a cult uh, animated cartoon now, which you can get in your video. <laughs> and uh, I remember him putting on a show at the Tabor Auditorium 
uh, welcome back, yep, you know, and he, <laughs> in 62. But that means that the Wizard of Oz made it big during the time that he was blacklisted. That was, and when you consider the social commentary that it was making, that's pretty profound. Yeah, but I don't think hardly anyone knows the political symbolism underneath the Wizard of Oz because, again, it's a thing that happens in Finian's Rainbow, even though, as Peter Stone, a uh, noted playwright uh, on Broadway, said it's the only socialist track ever on Broadway, all right? People don't hear the political message in it, okay? They are vastly entertained. And the same thing happens with the wizard. You know, no one would even think of such a thing. My song, like when the idle poor become the idle rich, and brother can you spare a dime, caused a great deal of furor during a period in Hollywood when a fellow by the name of Joe McCarthy was reigning supreme. And so they got something up for people to take care of us, like me, called the blacklist. And I landed on the enemy list. And the, in order to overcome the enemy list, what was the enemy list? Well, it's a, one that you were a red, another one that uh, you were a, a blue nose, and the other one that you on the blacklist. Finally, I thought the rainbow was a wonderful symbol <laughs> of all these lists. <laughs> of all these lists. In order to overcome the enemy list and this rainbow that they gave me the idea for, I wrote this little poem. Lives of great men all remind us greatness takes no easy way. All the heroes of tomorrow are the heretics of today. Socrates and Galileo, John Brown, Thoreau, Christ, and Debs heard the night cry, down with traitors, and the dawn shout, up the reds. <laughs> Nothing ever seems to bust them. Gallows, crosses, prison bars. Though we try to readjust them, there they are among the stars. Lives of great men all remind us we can write our names on high and departing leave behind us thumbprints in the fbi today's program was actually produced for radio in 1996 with errol maitland and dan coughlin special thanks to gary helm brother shine and julie drizzen democracy now is produced by mike burke renee feltz aaron monte nermin shakes steve martinez sam alcoff honey masood robbie karen ryan dever adina gaz derman al khan mike defilippo miguel naguera engineer special thanks to becca staley julie crosby nick gilla hugh grand jessel noor jessica lay i'm amy goodman thanks so much for joining us